Welcome. Thank you for all uh, coming to the conference. We're a little bit early. We're just going to get into some housekeeping and other bits, and then we'll get the real conferency bit started. But thank you all for coming. We've got people from every state, I think, apart from this Northern Territory. And that's a big commitment, which we really appreciate. I mean, we can come up here and, and do these things, but without you guys, there's no point. So, well, well, we're actually a little bit out of order here. I will thank Michael for the official welcome in a minute. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we know you're running businesses, and we know your mobile phone's very important. If you could just put it on to silent. Very happy for you to just duck out the back there and take calls as required, because you know, people make bookings. Um, people call as required. Uh, access to Wi-Fi if you need it. Uh, it's uh, the Brothers Function Room, and all you have to do is accept the terms and conditions. There's no password, so you can access that. The exits are here. Yeah, yeah, no. There's exit signs out the back there and out there. The toilets, which are very, very important, out the back there under the sign called restrooms. I'm sure you'll be able to sort that out. And top of tea and coffee we've got happening, I believe, permanently over there. So as you need a bit of caffeine intake, you can certainly go and do that. We are operating under the Chatham House rules, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. So when a meeting or part thereof is held under the Chatham House rule, participants are free to use the information received but neither the identity or the affiliation of the speakers is to be revealed. So this is just to allow free, open and frank discussion, which is why we're here. We need you guys to give us input. We'll give you all the good stuff about what we're doing. So we can do that if we have free and frank and open communication. The, oh, okay, we won't go there. What we'll do is we'll call up Michael. Mr. Linky, our CEO. Just like to uh, welcome him to the stage, along with our president, Mr. Michael Monk. To avoid the confusion with Michael and Michael, we have Michael and Mick. We have some mics. It's very confusing. Yeah. So I'd just like to uh, welcome our CEO, Mr. Linky. Thank you, Jill. I'm only going to be a couple of minutes, then I'll introduce uh, Mick to formally launch the, the conference, and then I'll say a few words when Mick, our president, has finished. But um, welcome to Bundaberg. We've been here since Thursday planning a number of visits with a number of um, aviation companies up here. Uh, we've held our AGM and our board meeting. We've had a very good couple of days, and I'm looking forward to the next two or three days with, with everybody here. And I've got a couple of presentations myself during the, the course of the day. But um, that's all for later. Um, it's great to be here. We've had a great year, and you're going to see some of that over the next couple of days and some of the progress that we've made. But um, I'll go into that a little bit later, but now I'd just like to invite Mick, our president, to come up and say a few words um, and welcome everybody officially and officially open and launch the conference. Thank you, Mick. Uh, thanks, welcome, and thanks, Jill. Um, just put a lot of effort into this week, as have the rest of the stuff, and uh, I'm sure it's going to be a, a great, uh, great conference. Michael just mentioned um, <clears throat> we had our, our AGM this weekend, and uh, we had a board meeting as well, and we had a number of uh, Q&A sessions, and, and it was really, really positive. And, and some of those uh, the, the messages that we got back were uh, that the membership is really happy that we're starting to engage with them, and. Uh, one of, the, one of our local members here pointed out that these are not new ideas, but we've been really lucky to be put in a situation where uh, we've been enabled and, um, and able to, to bring in these ideas. And, and I think uh, you should um, thank the board and the staff for all the effort that they've done in that area. We've, we've looked at our constitution, and some of you who are here uh, at the AGM and the, the following uh, forums, and, and some of those who perhaps logged on online would have seen that We've, uh, we, we're making some really significant steps towards strengthening the organisation, bringing up our internal levels of professionalism, and, uh, and that should help us to provide you guys out there at the coalface with a, a greater, greater degree of certainty uh, in terms of your business and, uh, and, and enable you to do it more efficiently and easier. I think uh, from my perspective, our flying schools are quite often the, the first point of contact for our students. Uh, we, we get some inquiries via the website and via the office, but the, the real interaction between our students and, and our sport happens with you guys. 
And, and I know the guys are going to talk about the, the modernisation project later, but everything we do at the moment is really centred around making that interaction easier. And, and a huge part of it is to simplify your lives. So we've done a lot of work on our, our modernisation project. It, it's going to enable uh, CFIs and instructors and flying schools to interact and update student records a lot easier uh, as we go on. Um, simplify your lives and, and let you get on with the, the real thing uh, about teaching flying. But the other side of that is I feel for a long time we haven't supported you guys in other areas. Areas like marketing, uh, providing you with um, educational materials and, and driving students to your schools. So all of those things I think we'll touch on over the course of this conference. But to me, it's really important that we strengthen your business and we strengthen what you do and, and support you as, as that first point of contact for our, our students and our aviators. So I, I hope you'll find that uh, those elements are, um, or those themes are carried through uh, this conference. But um, there'll also be a lot of stuff uh, more directly related to you guys, the flying, uh, the syllabus, the training, etc. Um, so I hope this year that at this second conference, uh, and it'll evolve again at our third one over time, but I hope this year you, you'll see some notable changes in the way that we deliver that and, and we start to work more and more with you guys to uh, not only help you uh, in understanding new developments in aviation, but understanding new developments and, uh, and promoting and strengthening your business. So on that note, I'll, um, I'll let you guys get on with the, the business that matters and uh, I'll declare the conference open. And I'll hand you back to our staff. Um, and, and again, so thanks to our staff for organising this, uh, putting the effort in, and, uh, and I hope you all have a good conference. Thanks, Mick. Um, I just wanted to cover a few things off. I'm not going to give you a PowerPoint slide. There's going to be enough of those from Jill and Neil. And I'm not going to touch the whiteboard because um, Neil's stolen my whiteboard markers. So we'll leave those with Neil. You know how much Neil loves the whiteboard. Uh, but I want to talk about four key areas um, that, that I've really tried to, to do and the board has really focused me on um, and focused the organisation on. And the first one of those was stability um, and getting some stability. I was talking to a couple of staff over the last few days. And in the last five or six years, there's been five or six CEOs through the organisation, four or five tech managers, a number of ops managers. Um, we've lost board members left, right and centre um, over a period of time and significant turmoil. So one of the things that the board asked me to do was really focus on stabilising the three or four key areas of the organisation, the, the staff, the finances and the, the flow of information. Um, and that's been a, a critical area of focus and I think you'll see over the next couple of days um, how we've managed to stabilise the organisation. We've got the same management team in place now that we did when I started 12, 14 months ago. Uh, we've essentially got the same board in place. We've had a couple of board members retire at the fringes and we've, we've integrated and, and welcomed new board members there. In fact, we've got one of our new board members uh, with us today, Barry Windle, our South Australian representative, has joined us uh, today as part of the, the end of the AGM process. He wanted to, to join and engage with you. Barry will be with us for an hour or so, so welcome Barry. Um, fantastically switched on, um, energised board members. So that, that's fantastic and that's what we've tried to do. Get that stability organisation so that we can start to rebuild the trust and, and confidence. Firstly, with the leadership of the organisation, our CFIs. Secondly, with the regulator. And thirdly, with the community and our general membership. And that's a, been a real area of focus for us. The problem when you use these iPads, people text you and you get text messages halfway through them. Um, really, focusing on, on strategy, one of the things that, that I noticed when I did my research into the organisation in the first three months when I started was that the organisation would lurch, lurch from project to project, oh this is really good, let's do this, let's do that, um, or, let, let's, or, let's try this, and we'd try something for a month and it wouldn't work and then we'd try something different, we'd, we'd, we'd move on, we'd never give things time, so we've really tried to be strategically focused. And part of that first five month cycle when I was um, appointed and in November last year, we developed our strategic plan, which has focused us, focused me, focused the leadership team, focused the board on doing the things that we said we were going to do, rather than just chopping and changing. And we presented to the board yesterday the first 12 months result um, of that strategic plan. And we're getting through 
the workload. We're getting through the things, and again, during the course of the next couple of days, you'll see a lot of the outcomes of that. Um, there won't be a lot of new stuff um, in the next three days that we've thought about in the last 12 months. We'll be building on some of the key things that we've tried to achieve, um, some of the key outcomes that we're working towards. Um, and some of these things will take some time to, to roll out the modernisation, for, for instance, that Jared Smith, who's here today, our assistant technical manager, um, he's going to show you it's nine months in development, this product. It's not something that we thought about and we wrote overnight. It's nine months worth of solid work by four people in the office, consulting with a wide audience outside the office, um, and you're going to see some fantastic development in those products, but they're on our strategic plan, and the organisation is, is continuing um, that strategic path. The third key area of focus for me has been the, the financial stability. Um, of the organisation. We came out of a period of, of a series of deficits and deficits that were really draining our cash reserves. We had 1.8 million in the bank a few years ago, we've got 1.2 million dollars now. So I was very concerned and the board was deeply concerned and said we need to stop bleeding cash. Uh, we need to come up with strategies over the next two to three years to really get some financial stability behind the organisation um, so that we can then in the future begin to invest um, in marketing the organisation and growing the organisation. So it's about stabilising before we grow. We need to get more mem members. We weren't going to get them a couple of years ago with the, the position that the organisation was in. We're starting to improve that with the support of our, our CFIs and leadership in the organisation. We're starting to see that uh, financial stability settle itself down. A small deficit last year at $250,000. Of that, only $9,000 was a cash deficit. Uh, much of it was just a structural deficit in terms of non-cash items. So in 12 months' time, we've only used $9,000 of our reserves, which is fantastic um, in the tight environment that we're operating in. We've scheduled a small surplus for the next 12 months, uh, which is, again, something that we're hoping to achieve, and we're on track at this point in time, in October, three, four months into the financial year. Um, and that's something we're very keen to try and protect so that we can start to invest and grow and develop the business and work with, with, with you people, uh, which is critical for us. And the, the last of the, the four key things that we wanted to do was engaging with our members, engaging with everybody at every level in the organisation, from uh, a person who's just a pilot and doesn't you know, attach himself to a flying school after he's learned to fly, or she's learned to fly, and they just fly 15, 20 hours a, a year, all the way up to, to our, our flying schools that are running students through every week. We've got to engage with everybody at all levels, and then outside the organisation, engaging with our stakeholders, the regulator, CASA, ATSB, air services, whole range of people, other groups, other um, recreational aviation bodies. We've actually got a conference coming up at the end of October, the 30th of October, the first conference of its type where every um, sport aviation and recreational aviation body in Australia is meeting in one venue or one place to talk about the things that unite us, not the things that divide us. As Mick, our, our president, says, it's about aviation. It's not about a glider, it's not about a kite, it's not about a three-axis. It's just getting everybody up there. It's not about a wall bird. Uh, it's about getting everybody engaged in aviation. Um, and we're all sitting around a table and then looking at ways we can save uh, revenue, looking at ways that we can improve, and that we can engage, looking at some of the products that we've developed. How can we share those products? How can we sh share that expertise? We don't know the safety record across organisations. So Katie Jenkins, our national safety manager who's with us, engaging with those other groups to find out about safety messages and getting a consistent safety message um, across the organisations, analysing those risks. Are we better? Are we worse? Whether we're better or worse is, is irrelevant. The key thing is, do we talk and how we talk and how we improve safety overall uh, for the organisation. So I think that's critical. Better engagement with the, with the regulator. We've, we've developed a very strong, positive relationship with the, the regulator through the new Director of Aviation Safety, Mark Skidmore. Um, we're not always going to agree. I think there would be a problem if we always agreed. Um, but we always should have a respectful and positive relationship with that. I think we've developed that. We've had a number of very serious meetings at very senior levels talking about a range of topics that are important and critical to us, important and critical to our members. Um, and we don't always agree, and we won't always. But those meetings have been positive. We still get the support of air services for our gifts program. They donate $25,000 a year to support young flights. We're hoping to expand that um, and grow that over the next few years and really bank into that support. The ATSB are supporting us. They're training our staff at no cost to the organisation to get better skilled and qualified in accident investigations, audits, aviation law, um, a whole range of topics um, that we're looking at and we're understanding 
uh, and getting greater understanding um, internally with the team. So really positive moves in terms of better engagement with everybody across the organisation. Um, in the last 12 months, we've had a number of wins. Um, we talked about some of them um, at the last conference last year, but many others have, have progressed. Uh, we, we solved the registration issues for aircraft. We're registering aircraft in 10 days time, uh, within 10 days. Uh, wait till Jared gets up here, and we're going to reduce that 10-day cycle to 10 minutes. Um, and I think that's going to be a fantastic innovation when you see what Jared's got to show you um, on, on that. We, we're rolling out our electronic newsletter. Um, another success um, is our training and our training coordination role. And we've got Claire here today joining us for the first time. Over here on my left, Claire O'Dwyer, our national training uh, coordinator. Um, she's videotaping these um, sessions today, so everything's going to be videotaped and we're going to upload everything. Uh, we realise that not everybody can make these functions um, and these events, so these will be all uploaded onto YouTube at the conclusion of the event um, for people to share, use, and uh, we will use the, the 24 hours of footage um, in other segments and other ways to train and educate more people across the organisation over the next um, few days, a few years. Um, we've also rolled out um, the, the modernisation project. I'm not going to talk too much about that because Jared's got a dedicated session on that. that that's going live in a, in a week or so's time. So some exciting uh, developments there uh, that we're really looking forward to. So they're, they're just some of the things that, that we're doing. Um, you've got evidence of other things on your desks today. Our first um, annual report. The organisation, surprisingly, had never produced an annual report in its 30-year history. And we're losing the history and the great heritage of this organisation. I commend the board this weekend for the establishment of a heritage fund to protect the past um, of the organisation. And I often say there's no reason why our heritage and our innovation can't coexist, and they must coexist if we're to succeed uh, moving into the future. And by recognising our heritage, we can innovate and we can grow the organisation for the future. So a fantastic document. I commend the, the annual report to you. Read it, share it. If you want an extra copy, Please take them, we've got spare copies up. We'd love to see a, a couple of copies floating around in all our schools and all our clubs, but um, take them with us. Otherwise, Kelly, my executive assistant who's here today, she's gonna to get charged with excess baggage. So we need you to take those annual reports off Kelly's hands. Um, you've also got our safety guide. Um, fantastically produced document. Jill, Neil, um, and Katie did a fantastic job bringing that together. Um, revising and, and re-energising the 2009 and 2010 guide um, and a really valuable resource. Again, we've got spare copies of that. Feel free to take a couple. Um, we've got dozens and dozens of those available. We want to get those into as many people's hands as possible. We've also made it a simple and easy PDF download on the internet. People can just download and they can print it if they like and carry it around with them or they load it up onto their iPads when they're using Oz Runways. The really great thing about Oz Runways is soon you'll see a dedicated RALS folder inside Oz, Oz Runways that will carry um, RALS documentation um, all the time inside Oz Runways. So thanks to Oz Runways for giving us that space at no cost um, and helping us to promote and keep our members using Oz Runways um, across all our valuable information and sharing that. So there's some of the things we've done. It's, it's been a hectic year. I said to the board that the, the management team, the leadership team, is operating at, at V&E um, and has been operating at V&E the last 12 months. It's time to, to slow down and get into cruise mode um, and just roll out, continue to roll out some of those projects over the next six or 12 months. We didn't make many changes to the strategic plan. We're comfortable, we're satisfied that we're on the right track. We're prosecuting the agenda um, that the board has set in the last 12 months and we're gonna continue to roll that out and the team is, is dedicated and working really, really hard. So. I'm excited for the next couple of days. It's going to be a great time. I'm here the whole time, so grab me, um, chat to me, chat to any of the team. Um, nothing's off the table. We've got a closed session for you guys to, to talk about anything you want um, in that session, and then we'll have a feedback session after that. So a good couple of days. I'm looking forward to it. Um, I'll hand you back to Jill now. But thanks, everybody, for attending, um, and let's have a great conference. Thank you. Back to you, Jill. It's, um, it's kind of been an exciting ride the last 12 months. Michael's been very innovative, very supportive, and uh, it's given us all a whole lot more confidence to go ahead with the plans that we're trying to achieve. So look out, it's going to get exciting. Thank you, Michael, for the official welcome. <laughs> and as I said, we've gone through all the, uh, the housekeeping details. I'm pretty sure everyone will be happy with that. 
So what we want to do is talk about the aims and objectives of the conference just briefly. So that includes just a quick rundown on what the uh, agenda is going to hold for us. So the best part is we've got uh, specialists in various areas doing presentations, so it's not just the ops team, it's not just the tech team. We've got safety, we've got um, a number of people giving us uh, presentations. And the key, uh, I think, that we're trying to do here is give you as CFIs a whole lot more tools to the, the tool bag. We've already got a lot of tools and uh, things that you draw on for what you do in your normal day-to-day -day operation. But what we're trying to do as an organisation is give you some more tools to attract new members and work in a leadership role, because that's what a CFI is. They are the leader of the school, they're the leader very often at the field that they operate at, and they are the model for how we want to, uh, to operate. So one of the uh, key areas that we're focusing on is our, and that was a message we took from 2014 CFI conference, is standardisation. So Neil and I have been working quite hard, Neil particularly has been working really hard to uh, create an uh, instructor training manual. And we've been looking at revising syllabus requirements, we're looking at uh, the way that we deal with three axis versus weight shift in group B and D. So there's a whole raft of things we're looking at to try and streamline and make life easier for you. I know the OPS manual can be a pretty dry read, we're trying to, uh, to make that a little bit better in the future as well. So one of the sessions today will be uh, Neil uh, with an interactive session. This is where we want you guys to actually put your hand up, throw things at us, not literally, ideas would be good, um, talking about key syllabus elements. So Neil's been working quite hard on, on standardisation, looking at what's available uh, from other organisations, both locally and internationally, and trying to make sure that we're aligning ourselves as best as, can, as we can for day VFR, simple operations as we are, relatively simple. That's going to be followed by an open discussion session, which I quite openly acknowledge I've stolen from uh, the Sport Orgs Forum. So what we get to do is a group of sport organisations, CASA invites us to the, the forum, we sit down, we talk, they give us an open session. So they leave the room, it's open to you, to, to us to then talk about the issues that concern us without any uh, people in the room that you might feel might not necessarily contribute. So we're going to leave the room and leave you guys with a facilitator, Paul McEwen. Thank you, Paul, has, uh, has offered to facilitate that. Um, well, he got volunteered to facilitate that. It's probably more accurate. <laughs> um, but the idea behind that is for you to come up with key points that you've got that you want us to address or areas of concern, any ideas, any problems, any feedback, please bring it to us. We are in consultation mode now. We're listening to you guys. We want your feedback and your information. That'll be followed by an open forum where We'll hear what you're talking about. We won't answer all the questions straight away because it won't be possible, but we'll certainly be taking all of those uh, details on board and uh, taking note and coming back to you. And then the last presentation is going to be Patricia, who's sitting up the back there. Hi, Patricia from the ATSB. Got to see Patricia's presentation at the um, Aero Club uh, conference in Echuca, and uh, it's good stuff. It's good fun. So very uh, good support from the ATSB. All of the government departments are, are recognising the, the cultural change uh, that REOs is going through at the moment and they're coming to the party. It's really exciting. So uh, going on to tomorrow, very briefly, we've got search and rescue presentations. There's further presentations from Katie, our safety manager. And again, some more interactive sessions from Neil, um, Tricks of the Trade. He's been instructing for a few years. He's got a couple of those tricks in the toolbox. And it's also, again, an interactive session where we can talk about how do we get students to recognise or handle particular manoeuvres? How do we break through some learning blocks? All sorts of um, interesting issues. That will be followed by another session of uh, interaction again, um, talking about raising the bar. So we're trying to improve the standard of our instructors. So that includes how we train them, and that includes how we train the trainers. So there'll be some interesting information going on there. Another one from Neil talking about the new IT manual which um, you get to see some draft parts of, very small parts so far, but once we've got a bit of consensus that that's the right direction you think we should be going, we're going to be hitting full speed on that one. So um, Neil's been running pretty flat out already, well he's going to get into another gear and just start sprinting um, to try and get some uh, IT manual information to you for, for uh, further um, consultation. We'll have a presentation from CASA from the Self-Administering Sport Organisations section 
also known as SASEO. They'll be uh, giving you some information uh, relevant to the school dogs. Uh, followed by a, quite an interesting presentation from uh, Group Captain Tim Sloan, sitting up the back there next to Patricia. Hi, Tim. There's a very interesting initiative I'm not going to go into in a great deal of detail, but it does offer a tremendous opportunity to certain schools. It's not going to be something that's going to be across the board, but it is going to be something that some of our schools will run with very, very successfully. Uh, we've got a couple of things to set in place before that happens. But, uh, and that'll be followed by the, um, the dinner with a uh, keynote speaker, squadron leader Sarah Stalker, um, who was involved in the Women in Aviation uh, Week that was uh, held a little while ago. I'm sure you guys would admit there's 95% blokes in the room. It'd be really good to swing that around a little bit more, even if we've got another 5%. That's going to be a heap of new members for our organisation and a heap of new students for you. So we're going to start looking at targeting that sort of uh, area as well. On Wednesday, we're going to have Michael giving us the benefit of his marketing experience uh, on how to sell your school. So uh, hopefully that will be, well not hopefully, it will be a very interesting session because Michael's got some good insights that you've already seen in how we conduct ourselves as an organisation and part of that is the branding you're starting to see, these gorgeous shirts. And I forgot to mention earlier there are some more gorgeous shirts up the back um, which is all new merchandise. So we've gone away from the good old chambray shirt and given ourselves a little bit of a, a more modern uh, look, not that there's anything wrong with the chambray shirts I see in the room, but uh, you might also decide to have a look at that merchandise up the back there because it's, it's going to start branding the organisation very, very clearly in people's minds and Orange Theme is working pretty well for us. So uh, we then have a presentation from Air Services who are again a very supportive organisation. We're getting a lot of interaction with not just Air Services as an organisation but right the way down to the guys on the coalface at the ATC who are actually you know, calling us up and saying, hey, you just had a, a guy go through our airspace and, and we work collaboratively with that organisation. There's no big stick unless they've done something really stupid. Um, and so we, we've got a very good relationship going on with the, uh, AT, the Air Services guys. Finally, uh, we'll be going to Claire to give us some information on the training that uh, we're proposing to roll out. There's some very exciting times coming up um, for the organisation. Um, we're going to be... Um, should be keeping up with my PowerPoint, there we go. Um, we're going to be uh, getting some new initiatives for you guys, a whole brave new world of, of resources because we're all crying out for it. We want safety briefs, we want standardisation, we want videos, we want information for new students. So that's basically Claire's role and uh, she'll be working quite closely. She's probably been in contact with some of you already and she'll be in contact with more of you as we go along. Jared's got an amazing presentation. Jared, stand up. Please, come on. Jared is the Assistant Technical Manager and has been doing an amazing job with the modernisation project. He's been basically coordinating it. And uh, has <laughs> he talks to me about some stuff sometimes, I go, yep, that's great, terrific, love it. No idea what you're talking about. <laughs> He's going to be showing you some of the screenshots from the new uh, means that we're going to be allowing you guys, or uh, permitting, or not permitting, allowing you the access to Register aircraft, update member details. CFI portal we talked about last year is coming. It's not just, you know, some pie in the sky thing. Towards the end of November, December, we'll be rolling that out. That will mean you guys can log in. Is that a person a member? Have they got the right endorsements? Have they done the HF? Is the aircraft registered? There's going to be a whole world of information, finally, including an app um, we're hoping to, uh, to roll out soon too. Uh, and then I'll wrap up a bit of uh, future operations changes, um, which luckily we're fairly stable in the ops world. We've not done changes to the um, ops manual, we've done changes to the syllabus, um, and uh, those can changes will be continuing to roll out. We've got a couple of new exciting things that are happening, but pretty much business as usual from our end of the world. Um, and that will finish the conference, other than the uh, very kind offer from Jabiru to do the uh, engine and pre-flight considerations uh, and um, operational considerations that uh, Jabra have put on at their factory on Thursday. So there's a bit of an overview. Uh, does that sound kind of exciting? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it does sound kind of exciting. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, well so, going back to my uh, agenda for today, we're uh, actually running pretty well on time or early, which is good. So I'm actually going to hand over to our National Risk Safety and Compliance Manager, Katie Jenkins, 
Uh, and Katie and Michael and I will be tag teaming a bit on this presentation to give you some uh, update on uh, organisational safety brief uh, and initiatives that we've got. So I'd just like to welcome Katie to the, sta the stage. I've met a few of you over the last 12 to 18 months and I know there's quite a few more of you that I'd like to meet while we're here and I'd love to get some ideas from you. So um, during the breaks, if you've got an opportunity to come and meet me, um, I'm not going to be able to roll out a lot of these safety initiatives unless I have you guys on board. So please make yourself uh, known to me and um, come and meet me. Um, as you know, I'm the National Safety Manager. Um, some of you might know that I came on board in January 2014. Uh, the main reason was the implementation of our safety management system. Uh, I'll just bring up my first slide. It's a bit slow. So I just wanted to talk briefly about where we've come from, from the time that I've come on board from the start of last year. Uh, January 2014 was an interesting time for me. I walked into an organisation that wanted to implement a safety management system. And I think at that time, whilst it was being enforced, there was no real understanding of why that safety management system was needed to be put in place. And um, at the same time, I'm not sure even if the CFIs realise that with the rollout of the Part 149 that hopefully will come into play next year, um, however, we all know that's been around, that talk's been around for quite some time, we need to be proactive about the way that we implement this so that when the Part 149 comes in, our organisation is ready to go to transfer across to Part 149 and become more self-administering than it is at present. Um, so there was a lot of information that was given to me in that first couple of months. And one of the big things was that we expected you as flight training schools to implement individually a safety management system. Now I'm just wondering, can I just get a show of hands of how many flight training schools currently have an SMS in place? Okay, so there's quite a minority and that's probably due to your GA, your GA influences and things like that. So there's that expectation. I was very much aware of the fact that there are different tiers of flight training schools out there and the requirements that we need to put in place. Um, the benefits was that the board pushed back to CASA and said this is unrealistic to have to expect to each flying school to implement a safety management system and also it was difficult to be able to do that especially if you're an independent operator and the administrative burden that you're already undertaking just to maintain your records that have to be auditable underneath the, uh, the operations manual. So fortunately we basically got past that we could move away from that individual implementation and we can look at it from an organisa organisational perspective. So therefore as an organisation we roll out a safety management system and you guys tap into our system. So that will become less onerous and as I go through the discussion today you'll see how I'm planning to do it and it won't be done without your consultation. So uh, the main thing that we also did was uh, we had no risk management within our organisation. So your accidents, incidents, defect reports came in, they were received, they were given to tech, they were also given to ops. So you had the technical manager having to sign off on an ops incident because that was a process in place. So we changed it, we've risk managed every accident, incident and defect report since and we allocate the resources appropriately. So rather than tying up our ops managers and our tech managers to look at incidents that aren't even related to them, they only focus on their key areas and they've actually got more time to manage the areas that they're concerned with. So we've done that through our risk management system. The one thing we really haven't changed is our just culture. The way that we look at our accident incidents, the way we investigate, uh, we, don't, we haven't changed the way that we have used our just culture process other than the way that it is implemented through the operations manual and the upgrade that we had in version seven last year. So that's what happened last year. And the biggest thing that changed in 2014, I have to say, was when Michael came on board as CEO, there were no resources being really allocated and dedicated to getting the ball rolling on safety. So there was no influence um, and as those who have got a safety manage a management system 
implemented at present know you need to have resources allocated for it actually to work. So that was a big change that happened last year. So where are we going from here on? So as I said, maybe, maybe part 149 might be implemented in 2016. It's sort of like got told last year that it would be implemented uh, this year, um, and so we'll just wait and see how that goes. But what we're doing is we're aligning everything with the requirements of the Part 149, and Michael's doing that with the Constitution things uh, with the AGM he brought up the other day. He's saying that they're aligning the same thing. So we're ready to go when this rolls out. Um, there is a, an extensive period of time they expect the uh, recreational organisations to implement these before the exposition is required. Um, however, we, we're trying to be as proactive as possible so that transfer uh, occurs appropriately. Uh, we're now risk managing. So we're risk managing at all levels um, and that's a big thing that we've changed. We're able to support our proposals and our cases a lot better uh, because we're looking at them. For example, the modernisation project, uh, we risk manage that from the cost and the benefit to the organisation and we've kept an eye on it the whole time. So uh, that's been a big key indicator with our functions as a management team, the way we're moving forward. Uh, online reporting. This is something that I'm really excited about because I do a lot of data entry. A lot. Um, every time you send an accident or an incident report in, I log every piece of information off, off it. Uh, previously, not all information was collected. You can't do that analysis without all that information. So we're also changing the way that we analyse it. We now measure it against the ATSB taxonomy. Um, and what I might do is actually put that kind of taxonomy up on the website that you can have a look at and send that out to the CFIs. But basically it codes it up. So if you have a technical issue or an engine failure, we categorise it as that. And then when it comes to a time where we go, oh, there seems to be a key trend, we're using exactly the same form of fa uh, format as the ATSB are. And in that way, we're able to do deeper analysis and go back to the ATSB and say, we, dis we disagree with some of the information you're putting up on your website. Uh, we actually found the outcome was an engine fuel starvation. So th there's a the benefits that we've got to the organisation as well. Um, and organisational hazard identification. So we're only really just starting to get in involved in this. We're just starting to build on our hazard register and um, try and cover off on all those hazards that are uh, basically aligned with our organisation. Uh, we had our regional safety officers come on this year and they've been beneficial. They've given me great safety initiatives and they've also been able to identify some of the hazards that are, that are out there that affect their local areas as well as the organisation holistically. Okay, so the OMS, I'm calling it the OMS, Occurrence Management System. And the reason we're calling it an occurrence is because it covers a range of things. It doesn't just cover an accident, it doesn't just cover an incident, um, it also covers our complaints and as well as our defect reports. Um, it's also a bit of an ICAO, ICAO word that we're using, so with uh, the expectation through CASA is also to try to conform with the way that the aviation as, as a whole are, are um, using their terminology. And that's something that we'll work on just to push that terminology out there. So the whole idea of this online database, which will be in line with our modernisation project, and um, Jared will be telling you the back end of it as he goes through his brief, but I wanted to show you my OMS because it's quite exciting. I'm going to brag. So basically, uh, in the past, you have all had to do two reports, ATSB report and an RALS report. Um, most of them are hand filled out, I find. We've tried to make it easier. It's impossible. Um, what we've done is we've created an online reporting system. So the benefit of this is that you will be able to report to the ATSB and the RALS at the same time. At the same time. And that will be a that will be a big key indicator. Um, so all accident defect reports we can we can send off to the ATSB for you on your behalf. Um, there's a few words at the bottom that say like information. We might change that terminology to say I acknowledge because we have to send that off as an organisation anyway. Um, but basically, I'll just give you a view. Important accident. Oh, it's not working. Oh, it worked beautifully before. It did. Close. I think your screen's done its thing. Is it? Yeah. 
Apologies to all the technical people. Let's get the hammer. Okay, so this is this is what it's going to look at at the coal face. Um, it, it'll have two access types. It'll have a public interface, so any person of the public can report an accident, incident, defect, or um, a complaint. Um, but basically, that'll be the way it comes up. I'll just cover that off because that's more admin, right? Um, but it will allow you to report any of those four um, reportable items as a CFI, as a member of our organisation, and also the public. Um, it'll also allow you to go back through the back end and pre-populate information. But I'll just show you the, the first one. So basically, it brings up all the information. And this has taken, I think we started this development in March this year. And I've had oh, hours and hours of meetings with a very interesting IT developers um, putting this together that look at our processes and the way that we investigate and things like that. Um, so this goes through and it, it basically takes all the information that you require today for the RALS form, but we've built on it and you'll find there's quite a few mandatory um, sections there with a highlighted star. The idea is that we've aligned it with the ATSB report. So whatever you give us, we can report to the ATSB. And so I'll just show you through. It's not a long report, a report. it's a lot easier to fill out than the ATSB report. They've got specific security. Um, if you find that you've lodged an ATSB report previously, you've got to save and keep going to the next section. And I find that I have some people actually still prefer to fill out the PDF form, and I can appreciate that. But we're trying to make it as easy as possible. It also allows you to upload attachments. So if you've had an accident, you've taken a few photos, you can actually upload it from your mobile device, mobile device on the spot. Or if you've got video footage of someone having an accident, we can get that video footage as well, all attached to the incident. Uh, what I really want to show you, because this has taken a while to get through, and I've asked Neil if I can borrow his details, his member details is if you are a member and you log into the back end, the intranet, I'll get Jared to explain that further in detail because that's beyond my means. Um, oh, I'll just put in Neil's number. And he's fortunate it's not hooked up to Pulse at the moment, but it will pre-populate all your information from the Pulse system, which is our database, our customer reference management system. So you, you will not have to fill out some of the information in this report. So we've tried to make it as easy as possible uh, for the CFIs and our members. Um, also, it will link through and include your aircraft registration information as well. And if you have two aircraft on the system, it'll allow you to drop down and pick which one. If you haven't been flying that aircraft, you just delete it out and you put a different aircraft number in there and as much information as you can put in there. But there, it's just going to be beneficial for us in the long term because we'll be collecting really accurate information that we just we aren't able to get off the paper forms at the moment. Um, I just thought I'd show you quickly too is This is what it pre-populates. So I've got a special magic button that I press, which I'll show you. This is the back end of it. So this is a dashboard. This is the way that us as managers will oversee any of the accident and incidents. It allows us to risk assess it. Um, we can put different risk assessments on it. So like I say, it's negligible, possible. And we go off our processes about whether we need to investigate or not. Um, but a beautiful thing is, rather than you guys having to write your reports, we just press the magic button. And all the information from that report will be generated into an ATSB report that we will forward off to the ATSB. So I'm hoping that will minimise the amount of admin, especially our CFIs have to do when we send off an informa information report. If it goes up. Yeah, it's not going to lie. It wasn't me. Let's see if it comes up. So has anyone got any questions in the short term about this at all? Um, I, yep.
Yep, just one, since Doug is not, yep. Doug, you just announce yourself when you have a question to ask. Um, sorry guys, just to let you know, we'll take a microphone around the room just from a um, communication point of view. If you've got a question, put your hand up. Uh, one of us will run around, drop the microphone on your lap and go for it. So it'll just make it easier for everybody to hear. So uh, Doug, over to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, Doug Field, uh, CFI, Sunshine Coast Aero Club. Um, yeah, just a quick one, and uh, for us we have to do three reports. The additional one is uh, to Saseo, Sports Organisation of CASA. Um, is it, will that work for us to be able to, to lodge that application as well, so we can comply with that as well? Yeah, that's right. The if you are in Class D and your report comes through, the ATSB actually refer that to CASA from us, so it will go through to SSAO as well. Um, but what I'll do is I'll make sure that I network and make sure that's going to work because in the development of this system, we have liaised quite closely with the SSAO team and also with the um, ATSB to make sure that we're on the right track and we're covering off our legal requirements. So um, I'll go back and just check that. But um, yeah, it, the way that we're looking at, because you're obviously in Class D, um, yeah, I'm understanding of that, so I'll make sure that we go back and we check that it's ticking that box for you as well. Okay, so we're just trying to simplify everything and hopefully this will work out for you in the long run. Has anyone got any other questions in regards to the IMS? Are you looking at extending this to Dinda? Yeah, we are. 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 Yeah, we However, uh, defect reports, are you looking at is tech looking at extending this to defect reports? We have one here. Ah, good. I've got your defect report, it will reflect our tech manual um, and additionally uh, there's not, no requirement for our technical reports to go to the ATSB but sometimes they request them because they've had information that they've received from us so we refer them off as well. But yeah, we've got that. I'll show you the other one. And that, that'll do the same thing, that'll auto-fill by member number or aircraft number as well. We'll have our hazard report. We're really going to promote this in the next 24, 12 to 24 months, reporting hazards, proactive reporting. Uh, this will align with our safety management manual. So that information that we require from you guys are on there, is on there as well. And finally, the last report we've got is a complaint and it will be very specified that this complaint is for operational reasons to do with aircraft so if you have administrative issues with the organization you'll need to go through the head office but the safety management system is based around our operational areas so anything aircraft pilot um, regarding pilot it'll be stipulated on the front cover of this that that is what you report through this complaint management system. Very similar to the, the REPCOM reporting. And it, it is confidential reporting. So whatever is reported to us will be confidential. Uh, we've got a, a really good, robust complaint management system at the moment. And we're following through well and truly with this as well. Um, the beauty of this is everything is, is contained in the database and um, we will be able to manage it internally and it's a big part of our safety management system in getting that information and that trend analysis um, out, of, out of these reports that we haven't done well in the past. So what I might do is go back to my PowerPoint. Um, so just an overview of safety management uh, for those that aren't across it, there's quite a few elements um, I've been working internally for the organisational SMS, which is why I haven't had a whole heap of contact because what we're looking at is making sure that we've got a robust, robust safety management documents in place before we start rolling it out. Um, part of that will be though consulting with you as CFIs, especially in regard to our risk management processes and our change management processes. Um, and another, so basically organisationally we're 70% complete. Uh, we have already had quite a few processes in place already. Uh, we had Saseo uh, come in and do a overview or just to go through our safety management system, how we're going today, and that was quite positive as well, that result. So that was in about May this year. I think it was about May. Um, so we got some good feedback in regard to that as well. 
Uh, the biggest part of the safety management system will be rolling it out to our flight training schools. And we're very much aware, we're aware of that at the moment. And the first part is that we need to train. And the benefit of having Claire, our training coordinator on board, is that um, a big part of it is that I need to train, train people how to do what a safety management system is at first, because not everyone is aware of that. And secondly, we need to make sure that people are aware how to hazard identify and risk assess. Now, I know you all do it every day with your flying, you make that decision in your head, but unfortunately, some of it does require documentation. So my consult process with you as chief flying instructors and senior instructors will be, what is the best, best method for you guys to do this documentation? Is it, as an organisation, purchasing really easy software? Do you have the internet ability to actually use that software? Would you prefer paper? Would you prefer documentation drafted up? So I need to find out um, what is the easiest way for you as chief flying instructors to do that. Um, so Claire and I will work closely together and we'll develop some sort of survey that will go out to you all and we'll figure out what is available to you as a chief flying instructor. Um, one of my KPIs this year is making sure that we're starting to promote open and fair reporting. Uh, in the past, I had a terrible situation last year which occurred after one of our fatalities and I found out that someone hadn't put a report in a month prior, which I think we brought up at the last CFI conference, that directly uh, was related to the fatality because it was a similar occurrence. It was the same situation, the same technical issue that we had on the aircraft. And I had to call the individual and say, hey mate, why didn't you report? And he goes, what's the point? I've put reports in in the past. No one's done anything about it. And I'll tell you what, it was a pretty rude shock, but at the same time, it made me realise that our reporting culture is quite poor. Um, and I think there's still that perception that we've got this big stick and that we're going to hit you over the head. So what we're trying to do, and we've worked it into our strategic plan, is that we're trying to promote open and fair reporting. So if you get off your back and you report in, and it may be anything minor, but if you think it's important and you've reported it in, we'll take it on board. And it's all about education and training. And I know Jill's going to really enforce that as well. But we need that enforced from the chief flying instructor's point of view because there's a lot of members out there that are afraid of reporting um, and we're finding we're getting that feedback or i found a lot of people still aren't reporting i had a beauty last was at the start of this year maybe or last year i got a phone call from the atsb who told me uh, there was a forced landing that occurred in a paddock near ballarat gave me the small town in the area and i went and, they, and i said what's the registration number i said oh we don't have it I went, oh my God, how am I going to find this? So I called the local aero club and fortunately, someone had taken a photo of the aircraft the week beforehand um, when it was in forced landing and it had been published in the local paper. And <laughs> the, guy, the guy, he posted it into me and lo and behold, there's a beautiful copy of the registration number. So I gave him a call, I said, could you put a report in? We got the report, nothing major happened, but we're trying to improve it, we're trying to encourage people. And he was a little bit, I think he knew he was supposed to report, and the local police had called it in, that's the only reason the ATSB knew about it. So, yeah. And look, if you find that there are errors on the ATSB website, and I had one recently, um, maybe in the last week and a half, where the police have called the ATSB again, someone's had a forced landing, it's been reported on the ATSB website that it was an engine failure. But when we get down to it, we find out it's fuel mismanagement and someone's accidentally turned off the fuel tap. Mm. But it's there, lo and behold, on the website as an engine failure. So we can call up the ATSB and say, actually, can you change it? That's not correct. Because as you know, that reflects engine type, aircraft type, and it also reflects on, um, on, on our organisation that you know it's not technical issues within our organization maybe operational or vice versa so it's something that we're working closely with with our stakeholders especially ATSB um, some of the other key areas that we're looking at is making sure that we do deeper analysis of our reports we've done a lot of work on our fatalities and what I might do is you'll find in your annual reports that you've got copies of a whole heap of statistics, which is great, because it goes through all the information about our fatals, but it's very focused on our fatalities. Um, there's a bit of a rundown, it's in your annual reports, but just to give you a different kind of visual perspective. 
and it's not the best because the words keep popping up, but it gives you an indication, this is the fatalities that we've had in the last five years. And as you can see, once you put it on a, on a map like that, it's very East Coast based. So well, I mean, we might be able to focus on different aspects. Do we need to do some more education and training in some area? Some of them are quite remote. Are there members out there that we need to tap into that are doing their own thing, that aren't connected to a flight training school or a chief flying instructor or an aero club? Um, and this is where we're starting to come up with some of our safety initiatives. It was also this year that we had a really bad run for four months. Between April and July, we dealt with two fatalities each month, except for one. And every time something happens, our whole office stops. Jill, Darren, and we've had Jared involved as well, they basically had to up pick, drop all work, and then go out as an accident consultant on these in these scenes. And look, I'll get Jill to go into that later on if she needs to. Um, but it basically puts a hold on everything that we do in the office. And after that last one in July, we realised we need to do something, we're just, we're just reacting. And out of that came a strategic meeting through Michael. We sat down as a management team and said, what can we do as a management team to stop these fatalities? Because we had the information, we knew what was going on, we needed to move forward. So, Michael is so marketing very marketing, he goes, let's do a National Safety Month. And lo and behold, we picked October. It aligned with our Chief Flying Instructor Conference and also our AGM and our board meeting. So the moon's aligned, as they say, and um, we rolled out National Safety Month. And therefore, we've got your safety inserts and we got, we've actually received $10,000 worth of funding from CASA as well. So each, I think it's every six months, they do a, like a safety promotion round of funding, and um, we put our hand out for a lot more than 10 grand, but that's all they gave us, so we thought, rightio, um, and they were very pleased with our initiative, because at that time, um, we were having meetings with the Director of Aviation Safety, who wasn't just going to our organisation, but all the recreational organisations saying, hey guys, what are you doing about it? Um, and we felt like we were finally ahead of the ball, because we were taking this initiative before this letter was received. Um, so we've come up with some tangible items, and it is very marketing, but what we wanted to do is we wanted to get the conversation going. We wanted people to start talking about accidents, incidents, safety a bit more. We've worked it into our strategic plan. Michael talks about it. We've got Safe, Accessible, Fun, Enjoyable Aviation. The SAFE acronym is there. Um, we're trying to work safety into it, and we're trying to improve that safety culture. Um, from these initiatives, we're hoping that every maybe three to six months we'll come up with a new safety initiative. We're already focusing in early next year that we're going to orientate everything technical. We've got some key technical areas and Darren and Jared are going to work with me quite closely and Claire to come up with some strategic sort of uh, packages to put together. You'll find that you all got your high vis vests. Yep. Um, that that in, uh, initiative actually came from one of the chief flying instructors down near the Hunter Valley, and he mentioned that at a fly-in to Jared, and we ran with it. Because unfortunately, some of these safety promotions we get with government have to be tangible items, so we need to buy things. So we thought, well, if we market it through this clear mind, clear prop uh, slogan, and Michael's idea was that you want to make sure that you have a clear mind before you make that call to turn that propeller on. So the last thing you say is clear prop, um, so therefore we wanted to make sure human factors related, clear mind. Because as you all, uh, um, it's been plugged a fair bit in our emus, that our fatalities, 86% were coming out that they were uh, human factor related, which is pretty much on par with aviation worldwide. So um, we realised that we need to start targeting all those human factor related accidents again. Uh, you'll also find that you've got your key rings and we've did the stickers as well. The intangible items, though, were the hangar talks. And you should have received an email recently from Janelle, our lovely ops uh, administrator down the back there. And she sent out these hangar talks. And this is the beauty of Claire coming on board. We finally have a resource that us as a safety ops and technical team can tap into who has the time to put some of these packages together. So we picked the three key areas that we were finding that was in our uh, trend analysis. Fuel mismanagement is a shocker at the moment. 
I mean, there's a few people turning the taps off before they're landing. Um, and uh, we had low flying, and the third one, that's right, the weather. So they're the three ones that we're really focusing on. Next year, we'll focus on the technical issues, and Darren's going to come up with another three hangar talks. And we're hoping that we can get you guys who are on the ground um, to do your hangar talks, get people to come in. Maybe we can get aero clubs involved as well a bit more. And we want to get that discussion, talk, uh, we want to talk about all these accidents and incidents and get safety talks going again. So that's a key initiative that we, we're, um, we're working on at the moment. We also are working closely with the Ambassadors of Safety. Um, I'm not sure if anyone's on Facebook, but we launched our National Safety Month um, with Matt Hall, and he has been fantastic. He's come into our office, he's met most of our staff, he's really keen with our ideas. Um, Michael, I'm not sure if you want to talk about uh, some of the conversations that you've had with him in regard to his experiences. Okay. Yeah, but he's been fantastic. You'll also see there that he's standing next to the Director of Aviation Safety. So Mark Skidmore has been really responsive to some of the initiatives that we're taking. And it's really pleasing to see that CASA are getting on board, they're assisting us and they want us to push these safety initiatives and they want to improve these kind of terrible rates that we're having. So they're really pleased with the reaction that we've had um, since that really dark stage at the start of the year. And the last one is the amnesty period. Um, and we've all had emails sent out about the amnesty period. Um, we're looking at the three month amnesty period. It'll be a one-off opportunity where we'll get you guys as chief flight instructors um, to basically tap into those personnel that are flying without unregistered or no currency, uh, things like that. Um, I was on call the weekend that there was the accident up in Queensland with the power parachute. I think I spent seven hours on the phone and found out later on that member was one of ours, but he'd come off the registration details about maybe three years beforehand. I found out he'd been flying around for months, he was a big boy and he was flying a little aircraft. So, you know, just tapping back into those people and making sure that we can re-educate and train them, bring them back into the fold because we're finding that uh, we're getting a lot of phone calls that are aircraft and members that aren't even on our registration details. But at one stage they were. So we're trying to give them this period where they're not actually um, going to be any punitive action against them. Um, as you can see in the third point there, CASA have given their, us their assurance that there won't be any punitive action. And this is where the Director of Aviation Safety has been fantastic. He has supported us and said, thank you, this is something we've been trying to do for years and we just couldn't come up with a really good strategy and uh, it'll be a one-off period with a three month. So, uh, Jill, I don't know whether you want to add on to that at all. Um, there's nothing new in the amnesty because right now any of you supervisors can come to me and say Fred's been out in the paddock, he's been flying his plane and I know it's not registered, he hasn't seen me for a BFR for five years. So I'll ring Fred and say, hey Fred, what's going on? How about we get you back in the organisation, let's get you legal and compliant and let's get you safe again. And that's where we need you guys to be the leaders. Uh, as I said, you're out there already on the, uh, the airfields, you know the guys who are probably operating outside what they should be. Um, so what we've done is formalised it by, by saying we'll give you a, a formal period of three months. We've got statistics which I'll talk about a bit later of, of the number of um, certain categories of aircraft we know that are being operated illegally at the moment. Um, the, the best part from my point of view, as Katie said, we had a meeting with the Director of Aviation Safety, Mark Skidmore, the Associate Director, Jonathan Alec, and Team Leader, Lee Ungerman from Saseo. And at that point, there was so much relief in the room from CASA that we were taking this proactive stance. And uh, it was something that they were holding very dear to their heart uh, themselves, believe it or not. I know CASA is usually the big boogeyman. They actually are moving more openly towards an open and fair reporting culture as well. They only take a big action if someone's done something really stupid, like flying over a pub uh, and trying to do a lolly drop and crashing into a tree. Um, that was pretty silly. That was high profile and they don't like high-profile accidents that put the public at risk, and neither do we. Um, 
So that guy uh, we've worked with to actually encourage back into the system. We've got one of our CFIs working quite closely with him. He's going to do some retraining. We're going to help him to get his aircraft repaired and re-registered and we're going to get him back into a compliant state of mind. Now, CASA may then decide to do something further with that pilot because of the high-profile nature of the, of the accident. But if we've just got people operating out in the back blocks, as uh, Ed uh, Smith will attest out there in WA, there can be some guys out there that are operating and aren't necessarily being compliant, and it can happen anywhere in any of our backyards. Just let us know. We're not going to be taking the big stick approach. We want to encourage a collaborative effort with uh, the amnesty period. Yeah, good. Any questions? Eugene, um, hang on, we'll get you a microphone. Go, Nelly. <laughs> Thank you. Hold the door, guys. Ready? Or the red button on the bottom? Not allowed to speak. No. <laughs> <laughs> right down the very bottom of the mill is a little red button on the very bottom of the microphone. It's probably put itself to sleep. <laughs> Thank you, Eugene Reid. Um, I know of a number of pilots that have been flying virtually all over Australia without a cross country endorsement. Now, if they come along, tell me that. Um, they have, they'll be happy to do a um, theory exam and a flight test, but they certainly would not, not want to do 10 hours of dual training. All you have to do is prove competency. Good. So if they've probably illegally logged the flights, yes. Yes. we've got flight time there that meets the hour requirements. Let's just make sure they're competent. So we go through the syllabus, make sure they can meet all those requirements, do a flight test, do the theory exam, give them a bit of a smack around the head about human factors and decision making for doing that. Uh, because we had a pretty high profile one recently from Tasmania, well, it's actually two years ago now, that crashed in Bass Strait um, yes. and had quite a significant investment by the uh, Maritime Safety Authority to actually rescue him. Um, so, yeah. At least he was the first pop plane ever rescued from Bass Strait. Yes, he was. Mm. Yeah, as opposed to the other safety records where they just disappeared somewhere in the world. Correct. Yeah. So, look, you're absolutely right. And that's. It's, by all means, come to me. You don't have to give me their names to start with, but obviously we're going to end up finding out who, well, we want to find out who they are. But we want to work with you as CFIs to get these people compliant. We're not going to get on the case of saying you have to do 10 hours if they've already done it illegally, but we need them to be compliant with the syllabus and we need you to keep records that show that you've assessed that. So if there are any further issues, we can defend you and assist you. Thanks. Thanks, Eugene. Anything else? That's a good question. I'll hand back over. Well, that's pretty much the end of my presentation. I'll, Michael, did you want to say something? Yeah. Yeah, sure. And then we'll go into questions. said Matt Hall has become a, a really solid ambassador for us. Um, stuff there. Um, he's also a member of the organisation, as is Mark Skidmore, uh, a member of RALs as well. They both joined. I think Jewel did Mark's conversion. Matt. Matt, Matt and Mark. Oh, you haven't done Mark yet? Uh, we've done um, Matt's conversion, um, which was fantastic. So, he came to our office and met everybody when he, he joined and we had some photos taken and they're on Facebook and that was all exciting and fun. But the important part was when we sat down with him, Mick, our president, had an opportunity to sit down with Matt and talk about his airmanship philosophy. And we've been talking to QBE and partnering with them. And as Katie said, Matt attended the National Safety Launch and he sums it up in three words. He said, pilots have a, have a career in, in aviation and there's three stages um, that they go through. They go through that learning stage first they go through the expert stage second, and then they move to the mature stage. And the target for us is getting people to that mature stage. That's exactly what Katie's talking about in terms of open and fair reporting. It's when you can admit that, yep, you turned the fuel tap off and you screwed up. That's when you're at the mature stage. It's the expert stage where people don't admit those errors and don't admit 
admit those problems, um, or they get offended uh, when somebody comes up to them and says, hey, that landing there, you could have done this or you should have done that. That's what we're trying to encourage with this clear mind, clear prop concept. Get everybody together, get the hangar talks happening, and get people together. Um, and that's exactly, you know, Matt spent 15 or 20 minutes talking to us about moving into that mature stage, away from that expert stage. And when Jill presents the statistics of our fatalities, you'll see how that marries with exactly what, what Matt Hall was saying. Um, and I think it's a very critical message that we want all our pilots to get to the mature stage. Um, and often, the expert stage is the longest. So that's their career in aviation, they're immature or they're a learner for this part, they're an expert for that part, and then they end up with their mature um, thought processes at the end of their career. Our job, RIL's job and everybody's job, is try and reduce the span of time that you're an expert. They're not willing to admit your mistakes, you're not willing to take criticism and advice from somebody and you agree that you learn every day. And I think that's a critical thing. Mick, our president, wrote an article in Sport Pilot recently about mistakes that he's made. I've been on six or seven flights now since I started in the organisation. Each one of those flights, something small has happened. Nothing serious, but little things that have happened. And I've said to the pilot, oh, we need to talk about that. Well, you should talk to somebody about that. And I'm the CEO, so they admit it to me, it's pretty easy. Admitting it to their mates is sometimes harder. And acknowledging that they've made a mistake or they've slipped up um, and that, that's important. I think that's where we're trying to get people with this, this open and, and fair reporting culture. We really want people to tell us about us. The second conversation um, that day I had with Mark Skidmore, and he said, if I make a mistake, Michael, and I tell nobody, I'm the only one that learns. If I make a mistake and I tell everybody, potentially 10,000 people will learn. And you can turn that experience into a 10,000 person learning experience. Um, I've got a, a friend or a colleague who used to work at a major mining company and he was in charge of making investment decisions, lots of investment decisions. And he made an investment decision for this large mining company at some point in his career um, and it cost the mining company $2 million. They lost $2 million. Oh my God. A couple of days later, the chief executive calls him up to the office and he says, let's call him Bill. Hey Bill, I need to talk about this mistake that you've made. $2 million loss. And he goes, yep, yep. Here's my resignation letter. I'm going to resign. I've made a mistake. I've stuffed up. And he goes, no, I don't want you to resign. And he goes, oh, no, you're going to sack me, aren't you? You're going to fire me. No, no, no. Why would I fire you? I've just invested $2 million in you. It's a magnificent learning experience. You're staying with the company. You're going to learn and grow from that. And I think that's the philosophy we, we need to think. I do the same thing with my staff. Um, I think every one of my staff, me included, has gone me a culprit at some point in the last 14 months. They're all still here, I'm still employed, they're still employed. It's about learning from those mistakes, not crucifying people, and having that whole culture through the organisation, that whole culture across the organisation that we're human beings, we're programmed to make mistakes, we're programmed to improve, we're programmed to innovate, we're programmed to evolve, and it's when we start to admit those mistakes, admit those areas, that we can then evolve even faster and evolve even better and improve everybody around us. So tap into the hangar talks, Tell us about them. Let's get them on Facebook. Let's get them online. Get people attending these hangar talks, admitting and talking about er errors that they've made in the past. And let's write to us and tell us about your mistakes. Um, we want to hear about them because if you're the only one sitting there at home thinking, I could have done this differently, let's get that out. Let's tell people and we can really improve the culture and, and thought processes within the organisation. So that's really all I wanted to say on that. Yeah, there are there any questions in regard to some of the safety issues that we're looking at at the moment? Um, Jill's got a couple of other things that she'd like to add on as well. But one thing that we are focusing on in safety is that we just seem to be focusing on our fatals and it's just too reactive. Um, we've had some really serious accidents this year where people are going to have some long-term disabilities um, and these people are still alive. So that's our next step. We're going to be tapping into some of these serious accidents and the near misses and the incidents like Michael said and that's something that we're hoping to learn more from um, to see where our key areas um, or weaknesses are in our maybe our training, our style or information and trying to get that rolled out. Um, a, a big thing like Jill said um, was from operations is 
focusing on consistency with training and I can see that within the safety department that there are some key issues there as well uh, because yeah, there is some, some things that are being missed at the moment within the membership. And the other issue is, is getting ideas from you as chief line instructors. How do we tap into those members who after you train them and they move 400 kilometres away and they don't have any contact with any RAOs member? It was something that was very clear to me when I contacted the Gliding Federation safety officer and he said that, you know, you've got a club culture there. You're always tapping into each other. If someone's doing something inappropriate, you, you're to be sure to be told, mate, put your head in you're not doing it right. The problem we've got is that we've got these independent operators in some really remote areas just doing their own thing. And they seem to be the ones that we're having problems with, um, especially with some of our low level flying, um, out of sight, out of mind. Um, so what we're trying to push is, is if you see something, say something and do something. And that's, Jill is very much pushing that at the moment. So we want people to say something. Um, in WA, we had a really serious trike accident, and I felt I just felt the poor CFI. He found out after the fact. He had three people come up to him and said, "Oh yeah, mate, I've seen that guy do that several times. I was wondering when he'd get caught up." And he sit there going, and he said to me, "If I had have known, I would have put him up there and then on the spot." So it's that whole bringing that mateship back, and that's back to the tradition of the organisation and where we started from. We want to make sure that we bring that together and how do we reinforce and get our members back together so that they're not worried about that punitive action that they've had in the past and we have that open reporting um, culture and improve our safety culture as well. So does anyone have any questions? Martin Hughes, I'm from um, Jindabyne, run a flying school up there. Uh, there are RAL's operations on my airfield that have got nothing to do with my flying school and there's also GA operations there that have got nothing to do with my flying school, even though in some ways I'm affiliated with the Aero Club that's up there. Where, as a CFI, does my authority start and finish? Because it can be a very difficult, uh, can be a very difficult situation if you've got independent operators on the airfield, perhaps operating in a way that you do not approve of, as to how you approach those people as a CFI. So it, it's uh, a case of, um, do I have the authority to go and speak to them, or am I, am I talking to them as a professional, running a professional organisation on the airfield where I have no authority over that individual who's flying privately? And, and where do I sit with GA operators that are setting bad example, to uh, my students in an RAL flight school on the same airfield. Martin, I, I can appreciate, especially with the GA point of view, I can answer that, is if you have an issue with the GA school, and if you report it to me... No, no school. Oh, no school? Operate. Oh, if you have an issue with the GA operator, and you report it to me, then I can afford it to the appropriate authorities. And I've had to do that on quite various occasions lately, um, and they've been under investigation already. So uh, if it's GA specific, we refer it back to SASEO, and they have their appropriate departments that deal with it there. There's no issue at all if you report it to me. And I have had uh, various incidents reported to me lately that have got involvement with GA aircraft. So just go through the normal reporting. Doesn't matter if it's not RAO's aircraft. Craft, if you're involved with the GA incident, expect you to report it just like you would any other incident and it gets taken care of. And that's where we're starting to open up our relationship with the stakeholders at the moment. Um, in regard to the ops, if you're dealing with an RAOs, I might get Jill to answer that from an operational perspective. Yep. That from one RAOs, uh, RAOs ops to uh, CFI to another. Yep. So this is uh, often quite a delicate process. We've got a number of fields where there's two and three schools on the one field and part of what Katie will be implementing as SMS will be for those three operations, two operations, whatever, to be acting collaboratively and perhaps even appoint a person to be responsible for safety on the field. But when you're talking about it in terms of Kelvin has someone at his school, I always pick on Kelvin because he's in the front row, and there's some other school at his field and he sees something going on, well obviously the best approach is to do the collaborative 
hey, we're all in this together, how about we make sure these are all done properly? If that approach doesn't work, that's where you call and Katie is the safety manager, and she'll obviously delegate that as required to ops or tech or whatever the problem happens to be. But that's your resource right there. Katie's responsible through Michael as the accountable manager, there he is, um, and under part 149 that will be even a, a more clear guideline, the CEO will be the accountable manager to CASA for safety, Katie is the safety manager as well, but it's basically going to be a collaborative effort. We can get into adversarial situations where we, we have people that are perhaps not necessarily willing to see what they're doing is not safe. Um, I can give you a couple of examples roughly, but Basically, it's, it's got to be you as the CFI have an obligation under the operations manual in section 1.0, come on someone give me the code, 1.03, 1.05 CFIs. Uh, you have an obligation to report any unsafe acts. You also have an obligation to prevent or, or work to prevent uh, unsafe acts. So in answer to your question, Martin, under RAL's operations manuals, you can certainly work to make sure the RAL's operation is safe, as Katie said. Once it goes to GA, we can involve CASA, we can involve SASEO, we can involve the GFA. Patricia's got a question here, so she's going to... No, I haven't got a question, uh, but I'm from the ATSB, my name is Patricia. Um, the ATSB has a confidential reporting line. You can either submit it on, online, or you can make a phone call and talk to somebody. It is truly confidential. We don't get to know, I'm one of the investigators, we don't get to know who made the complaint but quite often the confidential reporting officer will come to us and ask us a question from our ex level of, uh, our area of expertise. I'm air traffic control, I'll come and ask me some air traffic control type questions. So you can always uh, report unsafe acts you see from the GA world, the RPT world. I mean, you know, you're out there flying and you hear all sorts of things. Um, please report those things because it is very, very important that we know what's going on. So thanks. Yeah, thanks Patricia, that's excellent uh, input. And we've got Tim. From the uh, Air Force Cadets? The Air Force, yes. Um, I just want to back up the, uh, the safety culture and reporting uh, uh, development. Right? In my 40 years in the Air Force, I can tell you uh, from first hand experience just how the Air Force has developed. It's gone from when I joined in the 70s to from the pathological culture of keeping everything hidden, right? not telling anyone. Um, and of course we had those absolutely uh, terrible accident statistics right up until the start of the 90s. Right to the stage now where um, uh, by training our pilots right from day one about a just reporting culture that they're not going to get in trouble with it and therefore uh, when I was in uh, the Air Force Safety Office in my four years in there the, uh, the num um, number of reports that were being submitted, and these are all the low-level ones because they're the really important ones that you need to capture, uh, quadrupled. Right? Um, the same thing I found in the Air Force cadets as well. When we finally got through to them, that um, you're not going to get into trouble by reporting, we also saw a quadrupling of the reports in 12 months. And in fact, Jill, I gave you that slide, you've got it on the computer there, of uh, Patrick Hudson's reporting culture which explains just the various stages that you have and the important things that you need uh, to be able to develop it are just trust and communication. So it's well worthwhile uh, just having a look and seeing what, uh, what Patrick Hudson had to, to say uh, about it and uh, you just have to start, right? Uh, the first step is the hardest and getting out of, off that first run. So good luck. Thanks, Tim. That's a very, very important safety message. And John, you made the comment that you want us to have less uh, reports, and we actually want more. We want more reports. We want reports about close calls. We want reports about near misses. We want reports about things that don't seem important or major, because we can see trends. And that's certainly what the ATSB does: is trend analysis of what might seem to be trivial things, but uh, when they're analysed in a, a, a causal basis like that, you can end up with quite interesting statistics. We've got another question. Mike, Mick, comment? Uh, no, I've just, just got a little bit of a comment. Um, I, I want to touch on a couple of things that Martin mentioned um, and also reinforce Tim's comments. To me, it's not about our, our reporting culture. Reporting is an incredibly part, uh, incredibly important part of our business and, and we can't learn and, and correct our mistakes unless we have that information. But to me, um, what Martin was talking about with other pilots, um, you know, not having authority to, to do or say anything, is kind of irrelevant because I think as responsible aviators, 
regardless of whether we're instructors, CFIs, aircraft owners, or just plain old pilots, I think we've got a responsibility to everyone. And I'd like to think that you know, this organisation that, that I chair the board of at the moment is, is one full of responsible aviators. We, we're people who don't want to have that conversation after an accident saying it was always bound to happen. I'd rather have the awkward conversation beforehand and say, mate, what you're doing is, is probably not right and I think you should change, you know, change the way you operate. Um, it may be an awkward conversation. You may view it as adversarial, but it's a hell of a lot easier conversation to have than the one that, that I have with Michael every time someone dies. You know, we, we have these conversations all too often, especially this year, where Michael rings me up and says, another, another one of our members has died. That's the worst conversation. We shouldn't be respect, um, you know, we shouldn't be in fear of talking to each other. We shouldn't be in fear of retribution from the ATSB or CASA or, or RAOs. We should be in fear of hurting ourselves. We should be in fear of being viewed as irresponsible aviators. We've all got to strive, we've all got to speak up and we all need to work harder to become better aviators and that means an open and transparent culture and that's the organisation that, that I would like to create and, uh, and forge forward with. And um, can I just quickly back that up? I went to a great presentation at Safe Skies recently and I'm not sure if anyone made it there at all. It's quite expensive, that place to go to. But there was an amazing presentation from a Norwegian um, safety manager expert and he talked, he put this awesome PowerPoint presentation up about Captain E. Smith. Now, does everyone know who Captain E. Smith is? Captain of the Titanic? No, I do, because I'm ex-Navy. I picked it up straight away. And it was an amazing quote and it basically goes into the facts that in his in his worldly experience, he'd not once had an incident at sea rather than just rough weather. Um, and lo and behold, of a year later, he sinks a sh massive ship in the middle of the ocean. So I just think of being not aware of the fact that you make incidents and accidents or you've made mistakes in the past. You know, you've got that self-awareness. I mean, I spent six years straight at sea on a ship. And I'm telling you now, I made a lot of mistakes. And the thing that we used to do, which was also enforced in this presentation at Safe Skies, was we used to go and have a few beers afterwards, okay, maybe a few more than just a couple, but we would talk about these near misses and these close calls, and this is where we're trying to go with this hangar talk, we're trying to open the conversation again. And, you know, there's stuff that I run into people today, and they go, remember that time when you had that close call and you did this? And that's the kind of conversation we're trying to generate because you can't tell me in your whole careers in aviation, not once have you had a moment where you could have learned from it and that you could put that experience back onto someone else um, who's in the process of learning and saying, hey, don't do that because I did it once and it was bad. Like, that's the kind of mentality and the, the thought pattern we're trying to have in educating people at the moment. And I'll, I'll just draw the two points together. Katie talking about the near misses and Mick talking about the phone calls that I make to him in terms of the fatality. The phone call about the fatality is the lag indicator. Something's gone wrong and we can report about fatalities and Jill's going to put some stats up and we wrote an article in Sport Pilot. Can't do a lot about that. But the near, mass, near misses, they're the lead indicators. If Katie hears about four or five near misses, we then get a training package. We sit down with Claire. Claire writes a training package and instead of the tenth person the tenth near miss being the next phone call to Mick about the fatality, the tenth near miss is solved because we've been proactive and we've got a training course out of, about it. So those near misses, um, we report them at work. I almost trip over all the time, don't I? <laughs> so we put little stickers here and little things there. So because if I trip over and clonk my skull, it's a massive workers' compensation issue. Plus, I wouldn't be here talking to you fine people as well if I fall over. So it's those near misses that we need to, to, to walk, walk, report on and talk about so we can solve things in the future. They're, they're lead indicators, that's what we talk about. It's like our finances. Reporting on our finances to members about how much money we've got is a lag indicator. That's what's happened in the past. The lead indicator is where we're going to be with our finance, finance, our investment strategies, our membership growth strategies. They're our lead indicators and how we grow the organisation down the track. So, yeah. Um, I've stuffed up three times then because uh, I own an airfield, my collapsed polo flat, and uh, 
on three occasions in the last 12 months. Helicopters have come across my airfield below circuit height, upwind across students who are doing circuits and I get so bloody angry I pick up the phone and I ring CASA or I ring ATSB and I give the aircraft number. Frequently they're not on the same frequency, frequently they don't even know we're doing circuits and frequently they're bloody dangerous. So what I haven't done is I haven't reported it to you people because I thought you and RAOs had enough to do. I did get instant action from CASA and I did get instant action from ATSB. Net result is they don't land anywhere outside my airfield. They used to land close to the hospital, they used to land close to factories, they used to land close to um, the um, fire safety organisation which is just outside my airfield. The point I'm making is that I suppose if I'd have reported each one to you, RAOs, I would have probably been able to get more statistics and uh, you'd probably be able to do more action for me. But as an airfield owner, that's what I do. I report direct to CASA and I report direct to ATSB and I get instant action. No worries, and we can, we can continue with that too, Mike. We can actually, maybe we need to advertise that more, that if you too have an incident with a general aviation sort of incident, then let us know and we can feed it back through. Uh, one of the really good positions I'm in at the moment is I've got a pretty good relationship with a person in Saseo, um, and they let me know of incidents that have involved VH registered aircraft. And what I'm doing is I'm going back to the RAL's operator and saying, I understand that you may have been involved in an incident with a VH registered aircraft. Could you put a report in? Because it would really be good to get it from your perspective because all they've got at the moment is their perspective or vice versa. So we can support the cases. Um, Jill just wanted me to remind you as well is that another incident I've had is I had a, an accident report, a prop strike um, up in Queensland and a, and a like a quite a low level aerodrome where the runway hadn't been fixed for 18 months and the volunteers were really pushing to get it fixed but the council was resistant and a visitor came into that airfield and whilst it was all barriered off and the volunteers had done their very best to make sure that none of the hazards were going to interfere with anyone coming in they basically hit a pothole and they had a massive prop strike and they had to get a massive engine stripped down so um, the aircraft owner called me and we put an accident report in and he said, I've called my insurance uh, broker and he told me that it's the second incident of that kind in the last 12 months at that airfield. And so I called the council as a third party and said, are you aware that we've had an accident report and it's occurred at your airfield? You've got a fly-in in two weeks' time. What are you doing about your airfield? And lo and behold, a week later, it got fully graded and the drainage fixed. So that is the benefit we have of, if you think of it, a holistic view for the organisation. We jointly can do things together to fix some of the things in your local area as well. And I'm, I'm also aware of, and it's like there's some things going on at tomorrow with their airfield at the moment. And, you know, I haven't had to interject, but if it comes to a point that we need to, we've got pressure as a big organisation with 10,000 mem members that can assist you in a local area. So that's a service that we need to provide back to you all in your local area. Does anyone else have any questions? What about, oh, it's probably end of session. If you've got any questions, please come, and, come up and see me. Um, I'd love to try and get around and meet you all as well. Any ideas, please, please bring them forward because I get a few emails coming with some safety initiatives but I can't do this, we can't do this all on our own. Um, you guys have all got years of experience and great ideas that have worked for you, so if we can tap into some of those ideas and we can start pushing them out organisationally as well. Thank you. Thanks, Katie. Uh, I think we're seeing some real uh, benefits to having uh, a safety manager. We knew there were going to be benefits, but we're seeing some tremendous benefits because Ops and Tech just don't have the time to be running around following up all of that. We follow it up after Katie has done the assessment, so it makes our life easier. We've got a coffee break, uh, 15 minutes, back here uh, ready for Neil to do the syllabus exciting talk.
Thank you. Have coffee.